Thank you so much for the kind introduction and the opportunity for me to come and talk to you about uh, not only Raoul Wallenberg, <coughs> because I also want to say something about how we remember and how we forget. And already Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, said that a sound society could not be dwelled in history. As people and as society, we must also forget. But we tend to forget some things and remember others, and that also shifts during times. You only need to see the debate about Charlottesville and how to remember the American Civil War to realize this. And what we would talk to today is the legacy of Raoul Vandenberg and what he did. And one thing that we could say for certain, and that is kind of problematic, is that Raoul Wallenberg is indeed a hero, a true hero. But he could be a hero perhaps only in Budapest, 1944-45. If we imagine that <coughs> they sent Raoul Wallenberg to Warsaw in 1942, I would say that the probability that the Germans had killed him in one day or two was almost 100%. He could be a man who made a difference, like he said in his own words, because Germany was on the retreat, they wanted to trade Jews for, for instance, money, lorries, oil or other things. So you could say there was a structural a development that helped people like Raoul Wallenberg uh, at this point. This will in no way make Raoul Wallenberg's deed less worth, not by any chance. What he did and many with him in Budapest was amazing. There's no other word for it. But when we remember him, we, we have a lot of pictures or images with us. And when they tried to remember him in Stockholm, we had kind of a discussion about if this was the right way. What you see here is a part of a larger monument uh, made by the Danish artist Kirsten Ortved. And she was also very wide in how to understand this monument. And some say that Give it 50 years, no one will know that it was about Ralph Wallenberg. So other persons than Kirsten Ortwig had to make adjustments. They had to put the name Ralph Wallenberg on places around this monument so that it should be obvious that it's Ralph Wallenberg and not something else that these children and other persons should remember when they come to this place in Stockholm. But some people that say, talking about Charlottesville, the most important thing is that we won't get another man on a horse. We have seen enough of those kind of monuments. <laughs> so how we remember is also how we tend to think about not only history and human rights, but also art and aesthetics. Well, more about that later on. Um, what I want to say also at this early stage is that Raoul Wallenberg is in Sweden at least uh, during the first decades after 1945 uh, mostly connected to silence and his international fame is not I would say first and foremost something that has to do what Swedish politicians did or diplomats. Uh, the other way around. And you could say that why he became so famous did not in the first place uh, had to do with the Second World War, but more with the Cold War, because you could connect the Holocaust to the struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. So you could say that uh, he had tried to, to be with uh, ruthless representatives of one brutal dictatorship, the Nazi one, and fell victim to 
roof level representatives of another dictatorship, the Soviet Union, because he disappeared in Gulag, and we still don't know very much about that. And <coughs> we think that he died in 1947, but that is only a hypothesis. Raoul Wallenberg was born in 1912, in August, and when he was born, he was already without a father because he died in cancer during his mother May's pregnancy. So the women in Wallenberg's family became very important to him. And another person that also became very influential was Gustav Wallenberg. You see him here with Raoul in his knee. And they didn't meet very often because Gustav Wallenberg was a professional diplomat and traveled the world that they wrote letters to each other, a lot of them. And Gustav Allenberg, he knew what Raoul should do. Because if you're a member of a Wallenberg family, you most of the time became a banker. And he said that you should also be that, but you need certain skills. And you don't find those skills in Sweden. Because Swedes, they are a bit behind, kind of you know, slow and not very good on initiatives. So, first you should go to France, that's good, learn a new language, and then United States. And Gustav, he had been to the United States in the 1880s, and he said that this is indeed the country for the future. They know what to do, they are very initiative, and, you know, they want to do, make a difference. <coughs> and some say that this time that Raoul Wallenberg spent at Ann Arbor University in Michigan was in very important for what he did later on in, in Budapest because he had adapted this kind of active engagement when he was in, <coughs> in the United States. And he first and foremost was in the United States to become an architect. And he also uh, did finish his education to that but never worked as it, because the depression led to that there was <coughs> not very much use for architects, at least not in Sweden, so instead he became a businessman. And as a businessman, he traveled a lot in the Middle East and in Eastern and Central Europe. So he knew what happened to the Jews, he learned that from Jews that went to Palestine to get away from the Nazi dictatorship, and he also so saw what was going on in countries like Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. And in 1944 he got a mission. <coughs> but to understand that mission, I want to... And that mission led to this. Here we see him in, in Budapest and I come back to that. We would have to see what Raoul Wallenberg had with him. And he had two heroes, you can say. One was Fritjof Nansen, a very famous Norwegian explorer, who also made a lot of efforts uh, at, um, during the First World War and the years after, helping a lot of refugees. So that was kind of a role model for Raoul Wallenberg. And also his relative, Elsa Brennström, who became known as the Angel of Siberia helping a lot of German uh, war prisoners uh, stuck in Russia. So he thought that these are two persons that I can learn from. And he had them with him all the time. And even in late uh, autumn in 1944, he presented the future of Hungary with kind of a modification of what Fritjof Nansen thought of how to create a new Europe after 1918. So they had a lot of in common. But he was also interested in fiction and <laughs> fictional heroes. And one of the big heroes in the early uh, 20th century was uh, Scarlet Pimpernel and Leslie Howard. And in the first film he is this English uh, nobleman and he is in disguise. Uh, in daytime he's kind <coughs> of a very feminine person only interested in fashion. But in, during the nights he uh, 
gets in disguise and frees a lot of French nobility from the French revolutionaries. And this was very popular in Great Britain most of the time. Perhaps not that in, uh, popular in, in France. But uh, even though they fought, uh, not they, but Leslie Howard fought in 1940-41, when he so saw what was going on in, in Nazi Germany, we must make a, a sequel. And this time it was not in an historic time, it was today. And it is a presentation right up front with SS soldiers persecuting a lot of people. If you don't like Adolf Hitler, you're in trouble. So now we have a confused um, archaeologist. You know, all academics are confused, more or less. But this is a professor and he's, he's helpless. And he says that I want to study Aryan cultures in Germany. Perfect disguise. No Nazi official want to, to make any, anything to stop him from doing that. But as in the former picture, he tries to free as many Jews and other persecuted uh, Germans from uh, Nazi Germany and into freedom. This is a great success. The trouble is in Sweden that you can't see this film. <coughs> this is because of Nazi German propaganda. They lean very heavily on Swedish officials and say that you shouldn't show pictures that, you know, make Germany not looking that good. And because they, they joke a lot with Germans. Uh, one of the Germans in this film, he says, for instance, that, you know, that new research, talking about fake news, says that Shakespeare was in really a German writer. And Pimpernel Smith, he, he has an answer right away. He says, that may, may be the case, but you have to admit that the translation into English is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a lot of jokes like that, and Germans don't appreciate it. But, but, there are a few occasions when you can see this film, if you're a famous person or a well-known person, like Raoul Wallenberg and Nina Lagergren uh, are. So they can go to the British Embassy and see this film. And Nina Lagergren is the source that she, uh, she has said later on that when they came from this, this movie, Raoul Wallenberg said that I want to do what Leslie Howard did in this film. And he got the opportunity in Budapest. And he did get this opportunity because of the United States. Uh, because the Americans, they created this organization, the War Refugee Board. And they figured out that we can't go to, for instance, Hungary, because we are at war with Germany. But if you're a representative from a neutral state, like Sweden, you can do that. And Ron Wallenberg's name comes up early on, and they decide to send him. So he has not been a diplomat <coughs> early on, but he gets this status. When it comes to Budapest in the summer of 1944, there is already a lot of work trying to stop the Holocaust. And a lot of that work has been in vain. The Hungarian countryside is totally Judenfrei, as the Germans like to say. All the Jews from the, the Hungarian countryside are dead by, the, by summer 1944. But in Budapest, thousands and thousands of them are alive. So they try to save them. And indeed, they succeed in many ways. And it's a hard work, and one of the ways they do it is to issue this kind of Schutzpass, and they say, they give it to person and say, now you are a Swedish citizen. And Germans or representatives for the anti-Semitic Hungarian Arrow Cross movement, they can't do a thing, because they can't interfere with Swedes. They are neutrals. They also have protective buildings and a system to do this. So you could say that in a lot of ways, and very creative ways, 
a lot of diplomats, not only Ralph Wallenberg, but other Swedish diplomats, uh, a Swiss diplomat called, called Lutz, they are making a big difference here, saving thousands and thousands of Jews. And those Jews would probably have been sent to death. Uh, many of them are still going to death camps. Others are sent on death marches. Some of them are just shot in the streets or drowned in, in, uh, uh, in the lakes in, in Hungary. So what he does is indeed very, very important. And you could say also about Raoul Wallenberg goes from being kind of a, a hero behind the desk, trying to negotiate a lot with just phony representatives for the German and Hungarian authorities. But as time goes, he realized that I must be in the field. So he is night and days, night and day, out in Budapest and surrounding cities, trying to very direct save Jews and succeeds, as I said, in many, many cases. In January 1945, he gets a message that a representative, an officer from the Red Army wants to see him, and he don't know why. And that is the last thing anyone outside the Soviet Union hear anything about Raoul Wallenberg or his tribe. They are just gone. And this is the next chapter in the story about Raoul Wallenberg. Because Swedish diplomats uh, like Stefan Söderberg, who is the Swedish ambassador in Moscow, and the Swedish foreign minister, um, uh, that should be one back. Right, never mind. Östen and Dehn, they don't do much during this, those first two years that we would believe that Ron Wallenberg is still alive. Uh, Soviet authorities says that Ron Wallenberg died in 1947 in Lubyanka prison in, uh, in Moscow. St we still don't for certain know that, but. So you had a window of opportunity during those two years. But during that time, Stefan Söderberg meets with Joseph Stalin himself, and he says to Joseph Stalin that we believe that Raoul Wallenberg was killed in Budapest by Hungarian fascists. And Stalin knows that Raoul Wallenberg sits just a few blocks away and says that they don't seem to be interested in him. So why should I be? And other countries like Switzerland, they negotiate to say that if we get a Swiss person free, you could get some Russians back to Soviet Union. <coughs> Swedish authorities don't do a thing. So the irony is that after 1947, when Wallenberg is dead, they start to, with a called silent diplomacy, to try to get answers from the Soviet Union and free Raoul Wallenberg, because in Sweden, we don't know that Raoul Wallenberg is dead. <coughs> and one interesting thing is that it's not Swedes, first and foremost, that wants this. It's this uh, Czech refugee, Rudolf Philipp, that is the one person who is very persistent, saying that we must do more. And there are recordings when this uh, Rudolf Philipp, Philipp is talking to Talia Landra, the then Prime Minister, and he is so angry with Talia Lander, who is very defensive, but as I said, nothing happens. Because this is so sensitive in Cold War Sweden to be too offensive towards the Soviet Union. And it's so sensitive that you don't want to accept the help that American authorities offers. More than once, you say, we, we will solve this, but they never do. And talking about Americas, it's in the 1970s that Raoul Wallenberg's international fame really is starting to, to getting somewhere. Jimmy Carter is one of the first who is saying that this is a very interesting person. Why don't we know more about him? And he starts kind of a, a campaign promoting Raoul Wallenberg as a person that is very important during um, the Second World War and the Holocaust, but also is very 
good to refer to during the Cold War because you could say that, you know, it was the Russians who killed him. And since the Cold War is very cold during this time, he becomes a very useful symbol. But we also know when it comes really to negotiations, you don't want to talk about him with the Soviets. You see that Henry Kissinger, he accepts letters from uh, Raoul Wallenberg's parents and say, they say, well, you, you will meet some Russians now in Geneva. You must talk about this. And he writes back and says, of course, of course, I will talk a lot about Raoul Wallenberg. And then he writes to the American diplomats say, no, drop it. We don't want that. It's, it's just complicating other things, like co talking about nuclear disarmament and other things. Uh, but as a symbol, he lives on. And also becomes one of a few American honorary citizens. And uh, there are only three or four of them, so he's very, very, he gets a very high profile here. And uh, Ronald Reagan is one uh, important person here, but even more important is Tom Lantos, who died just the other year and uh, who was a Holocaust survivor, and he and his wife Annette, they also promoted Ron Wallenberg for decades before uh, he became an American honorary citizen. And nowadays, you will find Raoul Wallenberg's name in many, many countries. And this picture I, is taken in Israel, and you find it in a lot of British, American, German, you name it, South American cities. Uh, so he has this international status, like few other Holocaust uh, heroes, or I really don't like this talking about Holocaust heroes because it's, you know, heroes during the Holocaust, I should say. Um, why did he, Raoul Wallenberg, became so important? Well, I would say that is it, this is because that he was easy to remember after the Second World War. Up until the Second World War, it was very often that you, you could refer to soldier heroes. I mean, you, you went to war, you were a man, you did some important deeds and you died a you know, heroic death and you got a statue or something. Uh, that don't work so well after 1945, not in, in democracies. I mean, where in North Korea, that would be another case, but in countries like Sweden, that's not good at all. I mean, in Sweden, we see us, ourselves as the, the people that invented peace. I mean, we had it for, for a long time, since the early 19th century, and forgetting that we were fighting quite a lot in Europe before that. Uh, but that don't go so well with neutrality and peace and other good words. Ronald Wallenberg is something else. Uh, he's a negotiator. You could even say a capitalist. And he's using his skills as a businessman to get results. Because SS men, they are in this also as businessmen. Because they got a lot of money out of the whole cost. And this is kind of an aspect that you don't hear so much about. They are racists and anti-Semitics. But they also want to get profit from this. So he knows how to talk to them. And comparing it with Oskar Schindler, the same thing. So both Wallenberg and Schindler, they are kind of, a, you could say, relatives when it <coughs> comes to remembering uh, the Holocaust. And this also says that we have to adjust how we remember a person like Ron Wallenberg. Because later on, this is perhaps not the best thing that we want to promote a man who made himself a name because of his skills like a businessman. It could be something else that is the, the classical aspect, so to say. But today in Sweden, Raoul Wallenberg is unproblematic. Not at all like he was during the Cold War. And I think the, the, the sign that you could see in Stockholm, and perhaps also the biggest irony, is this monument outside the foreign department. 
the foreign department that he worked for to some extent in 1944-45, the foreign department that didn't do enough when he was still alive in, in the Soviet Union. But the, the foreign diplomats today, or the diplomats of Sweden that today sees that Raoul Wallenberg is a trademark, a very good trademark to say something positive of Sweden. And they did that in a lot of aspects and a lot of colors in a lot of ways in 2012. The 100-year anniversary of the birth of Raoul Wallenberg. And Carl Bildt, who was then a uh, foreign minister, said something to all of us that should promote Raoul Wallenberg. He said that, remember one thing, you should talk not about what happened to Raoul Wallenberg in the Soviet Union, his destiny, so to say. No one is interested in that. And he said that because that is complicated and it's this Swedish diplomatic failure. But you should talk a lot about what he did in 1944-45 in Budapest. And that is kind of this humanitarian hero that Sweden wants to promote now and then. So Raoul Wallenberg, he became too unproblematic, I should say. Because he became something that he perhaps never was. And you, what I think also talking about lessons is that we get a kind of connection between a realistic hero and what we want to have as our role models. If we have that connection, we will be very it will be very helpful to have persons like Raoul Wallenberg to get inspired by. And that will Maria and Panilla talk more about, I guess. Thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs>